You are listening to the Jobber's Court Podcast, a podcast for wrestling fans old and new. Court is now in session. Welcome, you are back for this week's episode of Jobber's Court. I am Rasquatch, like always. I will be kind of hosting our show here at Jobber's Court and be going through our topics. I'm joined, like always, by the shining star of the Caribbean, the wise old owl of wrestling, Cedric, um, and as well as the man of a thousand and four nicknames that we use, about ten of them, um, Hulkster, Hulkamania, Hulkbreak Kid. How are you guys today? As always, I'm Hulk standing. Amazing, absolutely fantastic. I think I'm also Hulk standing as well. If I, if that's not something as bad, is it? No, I don't think so. But you know, it'll be a little confusing when I call you both Hulk standing today. But maybe maybe the people can uh, you know they can tell your your voices apart, and I think we'll be okay. Well, right. I'll, I'll just go a step. Uh, I'll go a step further, and uh, I'm Hulk tastic. Hulk tastic, got it. Nice. All right. Well. Um, We were able to book a a special guest this week uh, for an interview as well as to really talk about our our topics that we cover here on the roundtable. With us, we have Tyler Copeland, an independent talent here uh, near the the St. Louis area, kind of a big hub for wrestling out here. Um, So, Tyler, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, you guys. Uh, I've been excited about this all week ever since you told me about it. Yeah, I've been wanting to kind of get in touch with a lot of these guys that I've been able to see perform around here. And I know you were one name that I, I definitely had thought of uh, right away and trying to work on, uh, on getting you guys on. But before we can start the interview, we have to formally introduce you into jobbers court. So Cedric, if you could set up the ritual, please. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, the fact that I'm Latino has nothing to do with the fact that I'm doing the ritual, by the way. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm Native American. I'm Native American, so really, I should be doing it. But continue. Oh, we 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 both should be doing. It. We 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 could be doing the salsa dance and the rain dance together. Hope wow. I didn't offend nobody. Sounds great. Although um, if it rains salsa, we're in a lot of trouble. Continue. <laughs> Olé. Yep. Are you ready? Oh, I, I I did not go um, grocery shopping, so I'm kind of low in, in virgin blood. But I do have a little bit of tomato juice here, so that should help. Yeah, that works. Maybe some V8. That's healthier. All right, he's good. He's it's good. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling like he's part of the court now. So, again, formally, Tyler, welcome. Um, Cedric, we're going to pass it over to you first, and let's uh, let's get that burning question out of the way that, that we love to ask our guests. It's that burning, let's get it. It. It's that raining salsa right there. It's done. <laughs> It's hot salsa if it's burning. <laughs> all right. First of all, um, Mr. Tyler Copeland, thanks for joining us. Uh, always, we all all of our guests that take the time to be with us uh, we're, is always appreciated by us and our listeners. I just wanted to ask you, like I always ask our, our first guests, do you recall and and what do you recall that was the first moment that you became a fan of wrestling? Obviously, oh, you're still you're still a fan. Oh, yeah. And that'll be that'll be part that'll probably be the second part of my question. Like, when did you transition from just a a fan to decide, hey, I want to pursue something in this business because I'm not just a fan. I want to be like part, en- en- enrolled in the business itself. So that's that's my question. When did when did you become a fan, and when did you decide I would just I want to be more than just a fan? I'll tell you what, man. I uh, when I was a kid, um, it was the mid '90s, and I was watching WCW. Okay, and that's what really got me into. Being a wrestling fan, I love Sting, I love Goldberg, the NWO, I'm talking Hogan, Nash, Scott Hall. That when As soon as I saw that on TV, that's what really drew me in. I was definitely a WCW guy in the 90s, um, of course, may, maybe not the later 90s, but, uh, you know, that's what definitely got me into it. Um, what made me want to get involved in it, as I said, I followed it, you know, all through school, all through my teenage years, and uh, kind of when I got out of, you know, school a couple years later, kind of said to myself like 
why don't we give this a shot? You know, I got in the gym. I put a little bit of size on because I was always a real skinny kid. And uh, I eventually just got with the right people, got the right training, um, actually started running shows, which I'm sure we'll get into, um, WIA, Wrestling Invades America. And uh, really, I, just one step after another, man. It's just But being a fan led to wanting to be involved, and it's been a good last three, four years. Wow. So um, when you when you talk about training, um, how yeah. long how long is the average training process for someone like yourself when you're first sort of getting fresh into the business? Well, it completely depends on how often you go. Um, like you know, if you have a guy going multiple times per week, if they have a really good trainer like a Brandon Espinosa out of St. Louis, um, they can get it done in three four months. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, which is a relatively short amount of time. But if you're a guy who's going maybe once or twice a week, then maybe we're looking at six months. It depends on the person too. Um, for me, it was more around the four or five month mark. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the second that happened. You know, I just I took it by storm, and we started traveling and wrestled a lot of places since then. And uh, you know, right now it's just an up uphill battle. You know. Uh, so, so Brandon Espinosa was was your trainer, or just one of your trainers, or? He was the main. He was the main part of my training. Um, okay. I've trained with a bunch of different guys. Uh, I wouldn't say there was one specific period where I got trained. It was definitely sporadic, but uh, he was definitely the main influence of my training. He taught me the most out of anybody. So did you sign? Still does oh, today. Yeah, did you sign on with a specific school then, or is it just kind of a, a local thing that you guys just got together and just trained with him? Well, in St. Louis, you have brought South Broadway has a school. Dynamo, well, they had a school. That's the one that I trained at. They don't have a school anymore. Um, Dynamo Pro has a school, and then I believe SICW also does, and this is in St. Louis. Um, and I was a part of the South Broadway school. Okay, awesome. Um, so I guess before I take over the majority of the interview, I have a tendency to do that. Um, I know let's get you guys in here and see. Do you guys have any questions for for Tyler before I where I skyrocket this thing into, into oblivion for this interview? <laughs> yeah, before we uh, before we get too in the weeds here, uh, what would you say was the, the hardest part of your training, or uh, I guess the most taxing, either mentally med- mentally or physically? I would honestly say physically because it takes a while to get used to taking uh, the bumps, you know. Um, it takes, you know, a lot on your head and neck like the first couple of day, times you practice. If your body's not used to it, you got a sore head, you got a sore neck, I mean a sore back, but obviously the head and neck are worse. Um, so that was the physical taxation was definitely um, the worst part just because mentally I knew I wanted to do it, you know what I mean. Um, so that, that really wasn't hard. But, so was uh, there it, ever a – sorry, go ahead. Just physically at the beginning was the hardest part. You know? Gotcha. Was there, was there ever a time uh, when you're, you're waking up the next morning or the day after and saying, man, this, this hurts too much. I don't know if I want to keep doing this. Was there ever a time like that or was like, nope, paying my dues and I'm going to get through it? Well, I'll tell you what. The first time, um, and I'm not sure if I've ever said this before on a platform like this, the first time I ever had a, like a training day, I got a serious concussion. Um, I was taking just normal flat, just falling backwards, flat back bumps in the ring, um, drilled my head a couple times, ended up getting a concussion from that. I didn't know I had one because I've never got one before. And they, they told you just keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, I didn't want to look like a pussy, you know, so I, I just kept going, not knowing that I had a concussion. So I kept hitting my head over and over Yeah. the next day I wake up, I can barely move my head and neck. And uh, I ended up getting diagnosed with a really serious concussion that stayed with me for about four months. So then, I, I mean, I didn't – and so I, at that point, I stopped training, but I eventually uh, came back to it about a year later. But uh, – so, I mean, that was definitely um, a bit of a surprise to me. This is years ago, before I was – obviously. But. So dur- during that time, was there a, was there ever doubt, like, maybe, maybe I won't ever come back to this or would- – were you pretty dead set on, nope, I'm oh. not making it? Oh, completely there was a doubt. I mean, I was throwing up almost every day. Um, this, it was a serious concussion. I was sleeping 12 hours and feeling like I slept for two. Mm. These concussions are really freaking serious. I started losing I vision and things. Two months into the concussion, I started losing vision while I was driving. Mm. And it, it was crazy. But uh, thank God that's the only time I've ever had a concussion like that. 
But so, so what was the motivation to get back to it? I mean, it's just something I've always wanted to do, man. I just had to get into it. I said, I'm going to be safer with this. I know to kind of, if anything like that were ever happen again, I could identify it and not, uh, you know, obviously say, hey, I need to take a break, you know. <laughs> but thank God I've never, awesome. nothing like that's ever happened again. Yeah, I hope it never happens again either. Yeah, it wasn't fun. Yeah, I was say I've had a I've had a really minor concussion. I, I hit the back of my head on a basketball court, playing basketball, taking a charge, and yeah, I've oof. yeah, I could imagine it's probably that that same type of feeling. And mine was just yeah, yeah you're you're sick, you're physically ill, you know, afterward, and it yeah, it's definitely not not a feeling I'd wish upon anybody. The confusion, no. the headache, yeah, oh no, yeah, it's the worst, <laughs> definitely. Um, <laughs> Cedric, you do you have anything for Tyler? I just, excuse me. It's it's amazing. Some some of us got a little paper cut away. We stop doing what, what we're doing to keep pushing yourself through a concussion, you know, or or just saying, hey, I'm gonna return once these symptoms go away. And that's that's pretty amazing. Well, I think I actually decided a couple months after the concussion went away. I think when it first happened to me, I was kind of like, screw this. But eventually, over time, I was like, ah, I got to do this. Yeah, I've, I've yeah. heard of people that, you know, like like folks, I've known folks that get it, for example, in in an accident, car accident, and they've never driven again, yeah. you know, and mm-hmm. so I can only imagine the what it would take, the will to say, you know what, even even if it's months later, to say, this is something I want to pursue, I'm just going to be safer, and, and, and obviously, I was watching some of your matches, you know, it's kind of hard not to take a bump in a wrestling match, so to even say, I'm going to yeah. do this, knowing that there, there's a possibility, and, and like Hawk Stanley, so we we pray and hope that it never happens again. But it's it's a oh. risk you're taking every single time. So um, kudos to you and for for sticking to it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Man. All right, well, definitely. One question I I always have I, I like I like to ask it is um, for those of you who, who haven't seen you, how would you describe your style to to a wrestling fan that, that was curious what they'd expect to see from Tyler Copeland in the ring? Well, I'm always the bad guy, 99.9% of the time. Um, so you're always going to see me do something cocky. Um, not too technical. You know, I focus a lot on uh, maybe like a brawling style, maybe slowing things down a little bit to really build up a lot of heat in the match. Um, I like to throw some big moves. I like to fly sometimes. So I can't really describe it with one, with really one type of style. I just mix a lot of different things in. But it really, it all revolves around just being, um, a cocky, sure. arrogant prick, which really isn't actually <laughs> me at all. But it isn't me at all. But I can play it pretty well. So well, it, you know, it, I was saying it's funny because um, we the first time we saw you, I was was doing a radio show, and the guy who was hosting it with me, I remember he he had tried to say something to you, and I just remember you you pointing at him, you said shut the hell up, and man, he he sat down right away and was <laughs> like, I think I pissed him off. I, <laughs> I said, dude, it's fine, you know. And I, I was trying yeah. to talk to him, he didn't really understand how all that worked, but um. So, uh, but to to me, I would honestly, if, if if there was a style that was called heel, that would be your style. From what I've seen of you, as, yeah. as far as the way you work, you'll you'll do anything you got to do to win. You'll you know, yeah, most... use any kind of underhanded you know tactic that you can. You're not above you know the Pearl Harbor jobs, sneak attacks. You're not. You're definitely not beyond any of that when it comes to to you as a character. Um, I know last time uh, I had seen your your finish was uh, was the Moodle lock. Is that still what you're using a, a, as a finish, or are you using something different? I'm not really using that much anymore. Um, I've switched it over. I've, I'm mainly using the a curb stomp, with not like a Rollins curb stomp. Um, they're on their stomach. I'll grab both their arms, and I'll I'll bring their body their torso up, and uh, basically like a super dragon style curb stomp. Gotcha. I'll put my foot on the back of their head um, slash upper back and we'll just drive it to the ground. That and a TKO are kind of the two things that I'm going with. I'm, I'm sticking away from submissions. What um, what do you think makes you enjoy the heel side of, of wrestling so much? I, I just love going out there getting people fired up. You know, um, I, I really, I don't know if if it's that I like being the bad guy rather than the good guy, but it's, it's just like I'm so much better at being the bad guy than the good guy. So, you know, I just like I just play off my strengths, and that just happens to be what I'm good at. So that's basically what I play off. 
You got a little bit of a jerk in your closet, huh? Well, I mean, like I said, me, <laughs> me it, act, the actual me, totally not who I am, but for some reason I can play it really well. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of funny because I think there's a you know, there's a part of my personality as a as an announcer when I'm doing yeah. the commentary to be able to to do those types of things too, where you sometimes have to have to flip your personality. Like my friend will say, "Hey, I want to I want to run face announcer this match." All right, fine. Yeah, I'll work the heel announcer. Yeah, whatever it might be, but. When you, I, what I love about working like a heel style just for myself is I, I like the fact that your your whole purpose is just to piss someone off, and sometimes if you when you can control someone's emotion like that, I that's what yeah. I always like about it is if you could get somebody to to switch an emotion if they have some type of emotional connection whether it's good or bad obviously you've done your job so yeah definitely I, that's that's definitely for me the the kind of things that I enjoy. Um, so while we're on the topic of uh, of being heel, you said you're you're really not that way in in real life. What uh, yeah. what's some of your inspiration or your motivation for your your heel work? Really, man, it's just what I'm good at. It, like I I found out I was good at talking, um, and I'm obviously better at talking as a heel, and I want to play off what I'm good at, you know, rather than just kind of play a face and just be okay. I think I can play a heel and be pretty good. So I mean. You know, honestly, I'm just, there's not really motivation for it other than it's just what I'm somehow good at, you know? So I'm just, I'm taking it as it comes. And like, I didn't practice it. I didn't train for it. I just uh, was cutting a promo one day and then all of a sudden it just kind of worked. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to do this. So, gotcha. so kind of just like letting your, uh, letting your daily aggressions vent out when you're in the ring. You know, and that, that really is a thing because, you know, I can get really frustrated with what's going on in my life maybe, and you put me in front of a camera for a for a promo after a wrestling show, and maybe I can kind of build get some of that built-up aggression and just let it out on the camera. Um, and, you know, that, that's that been a thing. So yeah. well, those I are the best. They seem, you know, emotionally raw and real. Yeah. Well, I always look forward to your pre-show, like, promo type things when, I, when I'm following everything. Um, yeah. main, mainly because your your vignettes those type of things seem seem pretty well done, um, and obviously yeah, yeah. you you have a, a gift of gab so and, and not everyone has that so definitely something uh, I don't know how much the the other guys had, had got to see of of your mic work but I know mm-hmm. uh, that's something especially the, I remember the one leading up to Halloween um, last year I was really following along with I was really digging what you what you were doing uh, from that the one where I was on the face in the face paint yeah. Some of that, some I'm of so I love that pro. I'm so mad that <laughs> promo's got like 50 views on YouTube. Like almost no one's seen that promo, but I loved it. <laughs> yeah, I did too. Um, if I know what I'm doing after the show. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's got go like it's got, let's let's go ahead and plug that because that's a good promo and like no one saw it. But I'm th- I thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, no problem. Um, why don't you tell us where to find it? Um, you, I think that's on Cold's page. So you yeah, go to go to YouTube. I'm not sure what the title of that one is, but if you go to YouTube and you go to under Cold Meal Productions, just find any video that says Tyler Copeland in it, and it's probably me talking. Most so. likely, yeah. I was saying I know there's several of them um, with the, the stuff leading into that, and that was uh, were you still feuding with Jacko the Clown at that time? No, Brandon Aaron's. That's right. And, I'm still still, and then you're still feuding with him, and then uh, KLD was Kevin Lee Davidson was another person that that you've been working with lately, right? Yeah, I, I worked with him at Pro Wrestling Epic last year, and then we actually just had a uh, tag team match this past Sunday at WIA. Um, it was myself and Barakas versus him and uh, Brandon Aarons, and actually it, they ended up putting – because KLD is the current WIA champion, Brandon Aarons current Pro Wrestling Epic champion. They ended up put uh, changing the stipulation to where if either one of them got pinned, they lost their belt to whoever pinned them. And that's where I actually pinned Brandon Aarons for the Pro Wrestling Epic title just this last Sunday. Oh, well. So that was a pretty exciting moment. Congratulations. I know he'd held on to that thing for over a year so. Year and um, a half, yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess you talk about, you know, this with the, this company, WIA Pro Wrestling Epic. Um, do you want to talk about those two companies real quick and just kind of, yeah. you know, let, let us know how it's been uh, for you and working with them? Most definitely. Well, I, I guess kind of to start things off, WIA, I started that company um, about four years ago now. And uh, we over over the couple of years, we built up a nice team, a nice leadership team between four of us. And actually, this past Monday, I ended up separating it from them, uh, which is totally fine. You know, I wish them well. 
Um, they got a show coming up June 18th. It's going to be a good show. And basically with WIA and Pro Wrestling Epic, the relationship these two companies had, um, Pro Wrestling Epic obviously run by uh, Mephisto. Mm-hmm. Who we need to get on here too, by the way, but yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so you know, a good friend of mine, I was running WIA, he was running Pro Wrestling Epic. We just worked out a deal to where, hey, we're going to, no, no other companies are doing this. We're going to co-promote, put each other's belts on the shows and co-promote, and let's see what can happen. And okay. That's, know, that's um, about it. So that's what we've been doing for about a year. For your W, for the for the two companies, though, how would you – if someone was going to go to these independent shows uh, for either of these two companies, what, what would you – what would the average viewer expect to see at these type of shows? What Like what, what would you – a style of wrestling maybe or just to, to anticipate uh, family-friendly versus not family for that type of thing? What, what would you expect – or what would you tell us to expect? Or- Aiming towards more of a family friendly at this point. Um, in the past, we've you know there's been shows that haven't been as family friendly when it came to language, things like that. But definitely aiming more towards a family friendly show. Um, definitely a heavy uh, wrestling based show. Um, at least that's what I was that's what I was booking with WIA. Very heavily wrestling based. We got a couple stories in there. Um, I'm I'm not sure the way the way they're gonna lean things for the June show at WIA, but. Uh, I, I definitely think it'll be – I know it'll be a family-friendly show still, and I'm sure it'll be a very enjoyable show. But I'm not sure what um, what exactly they're planning for that show. Okay. And then Pro Wrestling Epic, um, is, from what I hear, we're, we got plans for the future that I can't really talk about. Sure. <laughs> All right. Um, Cliffhanger! Yep. Darn it. Yeah. Uh, oh, well. Uh, so um, – I guess we'll we'll change up gears just a little bit. I kind of want to talk to you about um, maybe a match or two that you're particularly proud of. That if you could tell somebody who's listening right now what they should watch, what would you recommend? I'm going to bring up two matches. Um, we have myself versus Brandon Aaron's from WIA last September. I, I think if you just put in Tyler Coleman versus Brandon Aaron's, it should come up on YouTube. Um, of course, we're looking for the match from September. You're going to see a match come up from September and February of this year, which was also a good one, but I'd, September really stuck out to me. It was our first match and um, probably my favorite match that I've had. And another one to check out, it's not uploaded yet, but it should be uploaded soon, is actually the tag match from this last Sunday, which was myself and Barakas versus Brandon Aarons and KLD. And I'm sure if you just stay tuned to the WIA YouTube page, that will be uploaded in the coming days. Two of my favorite matches. Awesome. Okay. Um, so I guess uh, one last thing, and I'll flip it back to the guys to see if they have any last-minute comments. Do you get a chance with, with your busy schedule and everything that you're doing to, to watch a lot of mainstream wrestling? And if so, like the mainstream TV wrestling, and if, if so, what do you think of the product right now? Man, um, I definitely watched WrestleMania. I watched uh, Payback. I have not got a chance to watch Extreme Rules yet. Um, I, I, I know the results. I still read the results of Raw and all this, but it's hard for me to watch Raw, man. Um, I, I don't like a lot of the stuff they're doing, um, which I think we'll get into that a little later. Sure. Mm-hmm. But I, I definitely keep up to date. I read the results. Um, if something big happens, I'll watch the replay of it. I try to watch every pay per view. I have the network, um, but really, man, I just uh, some of the stuff that's going on is just makes no sense to me. Why is Roman Reigns still a face? Why did Seth Rollins come back as a heel? Um, a lot of the stuff just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, and I think that that's going to be good here when we when we do get into uh, the topic. We are going to talk about creative today, um, WWE creative yeah. in particular. So. You you'll have some vital insight from a from a booking perspective as well because yeah. we all we all think we're we're fantasy bookers but we you know never actually booked a match except on uh-huh. the total it's extreme warfare fantasy. except on the the total extreme warfare game on the computer get it but anyway yeah so so uh, um all right guys do you have do you have any other questions for uh, for Tyler that we we can see if you guys have have any any things and then we'll let him get all his stuff plugged and we'll jump into the subjects. What you got, Cedric? Uh, so something that R- Rasquash always brings up, and he always does it very carefully. <laughs> he always asks our guests, and I'm going to go ahead and do so if you, if you don't mind, Rasquash. Is um, do you have any 
Um, Tyler, do you have any, you know, prank or joke or anything to happen with, like, in your, on your way on, on the road to a, to a match or within the match that you can actually talk about that might not be like breaking the rules of like whatever, whatever happens stays in the road or happens in the, or happens yeah. in the ring or stay in the ring? Anything funny they can share or you, even if it's not funny, something that you think, hey, this is funny or this is impactful, you know, that the listeners might want to hear? Yeah. Well, uh, man, and I know what's going to happen in like an hour. Something's going to hit me that uh, that happened that I should have brought up. But uh, yeah, it was funny actually. The day before the last show, I made a prank call to one of the wrestlers. It, it was a Sunday show, and I made a prank call to him on Saturday, and basically said, uh, "Hey, where are you at, man? The show starting in like two hours or something." Making him think it was the, it was on Saturday and not Sunday, and he had the day wrong. <laughs> Just totally serious. And he's like, well, 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 uh, no, the show's supposed to be tomorrow. And I'm like, nah, man, the show's today. The show starts in two hours. And he's like, oh, well, no, I was with, I was with SP yesterday and he told me, he said the show was Sunday. And I was like, SP's here. <laughs> and, and then I'm not going to say his name because he'll be embarrassed, but, sure. and then he, he just had the most sad, the, he was the most sad, depressed voice I've ever heard. Just so upset that he was missing, and then I just started cracking up laughing. I was like, "Dude, the show's tomorrow. Yeah, I'm just messing with you." <laughs> I, I genuinely felt bad for the prank. Uh, he I don't was know. So I upset don't, I don't, about I don't, it, and I genuinely felt I felt I felt bad about it. I don't know. I think those were the best ones. I was saying. Yeah, no, it was good though. That, that that's nothing though. I'm so, a ton of other stuff's happening. I know they're gonna. It's gonna hit me in like an hour, but that's all I got. For now. Have you had any? Um, you ever had any funny like like botches or something or something went went wrong or where you got kind of had to to work on the fly that that was kind of funny at the moment in the ring or a time in the ring where maybe it was it was hard to kind of stay in character. Hmm. Gosh, like I said, something always happens. I'll always have like a really like redneck fan or some somebody will yell at me and I'll have a good comeback. But so that that happens almost every time. Uh, but that's so on the fly that. Yeah, I, I did notice that in some of your matches, the the psychology you between you, between you and the crowd was pretty oh, amazing. I always you, find somebody in the crowd. Yeah, you'll do something to an opponent, and then you'll turn around to like what seems to be that number one fan of that opponent. <laughs> you look at, hey, yeah. you saw that? Like, was that good? <laughs> and I'm pretty sure they turn around and probably like cursing you out. But you're like, whatever, you yeah. keep doing your own thing. <laughs> I, oh, I'll say it's funny because we had we had Danny Adams on one of our one of our first shows. And I know it's funny. You both you both have a lot of really good crowd interaction, but in different ways. Whereas, uh, like he he'll let the crowd as his character, he'll let the crowd get to him, and he'll he'll throw like a temper tantrum, or he'll you know he'll get that that real that real upset, frustrated. And yeah. you you're you're just very like yep yeah, whatever, or you'll you know you'll come at him with something verbally, and I, I always uh, <laughs> like that. Or um. I know uh, I I would love to see because I, I don't think I've got to see you work with him yet, but just the the facial expressions I think that you'd have with working with somebody like Billy McNeil. So for some of you that don't know, oh, yeah. he kind of has I would love that. he has a like a monkey mask thing he comes out in. He's got a real silly gimmick. Like sometimes he, he really you know he pretends like he doesn't understand technology sometimes. So it's really good stuff. I could just see you trying to work you know work with a guy like that and, and trying to trying to carry that from two completely you know different perspectives, face and, and heel mm -hmm. perspective. So. Um, I, I got know. a good one, guys. No, go ahead. All right, so th this is something from my match with Brandon in February that uh, I kind of set up, and this was a nice little crowd interaction. I had a buddy of mine um, who was just there watching the show. I sent him a text. I'm like, hey, go grab me a drink from the bar and just sit in the front row, and whenever I come, get it from you. I need you I'm just going to take it from you. And so he was like, all right. So I basically planned it out. I come and I, I have Brandon down on the outside. I'm just talking, you know, talking shit to the crowd playing it up i'm the man you know stuff like that then i went and took the drink from him and i cheers the crowd and i and i chug it down so it's still in my mouth i turn around i have him to start lighting me up with kicks so i just spit it out everywhere and it was it was definitely uh so that was a nice little crowd interaction moment that we played out so anything i can do to like get cocky and then make the crowd hate me and then i can give let them see me like fall or do something stupid you know so they get happy again that's that's what i'm going for uh, yeah, I think um, I think of all the guys I saw, you know, it, it was funny because uh, there were in the independent shows that that I saw. I think the, initially there there were three guys that I, I remember really watching and, and really really liking in my first couple independent shows, and that was um, Danny. Adams, 
you and um, and Brandon Aarons. I thought it was like between the three, yeah. I was like, wow, these guys are all really, really good. And then Brandon Espinosa, I sort of got an appreciation for him over time. I think the first time yeah. I saw him was in St. Louis Anarchy, and I was like, oh, this guy's all right, you know, but he was um, – yeah. And then after that, he sort of grew on me. So he's another one that, you know, I'm watching more and more now. um, Good. You know, as I've seen all those types of things. So it was good that you mentioned him. And then we mentioned he trained you. I said, oh, yeah, okay. You know, he seems like that that type of person and the big, you know, the the veteran amongst you guys. I know he's been wrestling for quite a while, too. Same thing with Brandon Aarons. I know he's a young guy, but he's been wrestling 10 years or something. So, Um, but, uh, all right. Um, do Do you guys have anything else before we start shifting gears to get to the topics? Yeah, I got one last question for you. Uh, we've yeah. had uh, we've had Kurt Stallion and we've had uh, Danny Adams on the show, uh, both students of the Michael Elgin program. Uh, you trained under Brandon Espinoza. What would you say is probably the best knowledge or the best advice or whatever you want to call it that he's imparted upon you or something that really stick or stuck out from just – an average training or just a regular training session? What was something that has really stuck with you throughout your career? Oh, man, he's taught me so much. I would definitely say transitioning from one um, spot to the next is something that he completely um, helped me with and definitely helped me. I don't want to say perfect because I'm nowhere near perfected on any of that, but, you know, um, definitely helped me improve on Um so definitely, I mean, I had some, I had some basics down, and he definitely helped me transition, figure out how to place them, figure out how to transition from one thing to another, and uh, I 100% credit him for that. I dig it, very cool. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I actually got one more question, uh, piggybacking off of that. Uh, we've heard a lot of uh, a lot of nightmare stories uh, of, of the backstage politics in uh, in a lot of wrestling companies, both indie and television. So uh, as a as both a talent and as a promoter, uh, what would you say is your best advice for someone trying to break into the business uh, to kind of set themselves up for success down the road? Hmm. Just as a wrestler? Anything. Just a uh, wrestler, referee, ballet, or someone that wants to start their own company. Just wh- whatever you think uh, would be the best advice for breaking into the industry as a as a whole. Well, it's one of the... It, uh, the whole backstage politics and just wrestlers in general on the indie scene, and it's probably like that up there too. The, the most dramatic, one of the most dramatic scenes that I've ever been a part of. You know what I mean? Everything is a huge deal, and um, I would just say don't get involved in any of the drama. You know, um, just go out there and do your best because I, I'm like I'm not even kidding. Everything is like a huge deal, and you'll have people call you and want to talk for hours about this smallest things and just just stay out of the drama have have fun with it and just work on yourself i dig it cool. even though it is kind of exciting just to hear hear people uh really get worked up over really small stuff yeah i got you i got you well tyler uh well, thank you um before we move on to our our subject of talking about wwe creative um, do you want to go ahead and put out there for everybody where they can find you on any of your various amounts of social media Definitely. You can find me on uh, Facebook just as Tyler Copeland. I don't have a fan page up. Um, Instagram, I believe, is infamous underscore TC. Um, I'm on Snapchat now, INFTC1. And then YouTube, you can find some of my stuff in under the Cold Meal Productions page and uh, the WIA um, wrestling page, which I am no longer uh, – uh, which I'm no longer wrestling for, but you're going to be able to find a lot of my old stuff on there. All right. So, um, great. And uh, I guess the the main thing now is since being our being our guest, we're going to let you start this topic out. Um, we kind of had the yeah. discussion of doing this topic um, kind of with things you, you kind of alluded to earlier, talking about Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, et cetera, but um, – our subject today is going to be WWE creative and are they killing talent? Um, because this really, we talked about Ryback last week and some of the situations he was having with pay. And then now we have the departure of, of Cody Rhodes and basically laying it out there that creative is one of the main reasons why he's leaving. So from, from your perspective, just looking at it from a booking, from a booker's mindset, from a promoter's mindset, 
do you think that it's the, the WWE creative is, is really what's killing the product right now? Or do you think um, do you think they're, the talent shortage that they had from injuries might be part of the problem? No, it's I think it's a hundred it's either creative or uh, maybe the creative actually has good ideas, but you have somebody at the very top who's turning them down. But they have plenty of people on the roster right now to make it interesting. They're just not doing it. Um, so I don't know if the creative is just horrible or if whoever's up top is just shutting down good ideas, but something's definitely going on because you got guys like Kevin Owens, you got guys like even Roman Reigns could be a great champion as a heel. Um, AJ Styles is there. You got guys in NXT who you could bring up. You got guys like Cesaro. So they could have an interesting product. It's just not. It's just not interesting. And I think it's definitely either the creative or the uh, very top. And I don't know how that they don't see that, and notice that. So from your perspective, what is the the worst part of what you're seeing creatively? What are some things? Well, is, is there anything you think they're doing well? And then is there any like you know, what main things do you think they could improve upon as a creative? Team. Well, yeah, they're definitely doing things. They're they're doing things, uh, certain things well. Like I, I like the, definitely like payback the way they had to set up the matches they had. Um, I just probably would have changed some of the face and heel roles, but uh, they're putting good, great matches together. I love WrestleMania. Mm-hmm. So I mean, they're not putting out a bad product. It's just the fact that they have a potential to put out a really great product, and they're putting out an okay product. That, that's what I don't like. Um, but what was the – did I skip over the question? Um, just mainly what you, – you said what do you think they're doing well. So from your perspective, what are some things that are really bad and that they can – and how would you improve upon them if, if you were part of the creative team? Okay. Well, I would change some of the face and heel roles. Like Rome, you got Roman Reigns. Uh, obviously, we're going to throw him – turn him heel when Seth Rollins comes. But AJ was going to be the face in the match. Reigns is the heel. Reigns does something. He doesn't really need to do anything dirty. He can maybe even go over strong as a heel. Rollins comes out pure face at the end of the pay-per-view instead of a heel. Gets a monstrous pop just like he did. Maybe it's even more now because he's actually playing a face. Um, so that's one thing you definitely want to change. And that's right there is going to be an exciting summer. Um, now Roman's all of a sudden an exciting champion. I know he's a heel, so he's going to get booed. But at least he can fit into that role. Um we're going to have guys for other than the world title actually fight for contendership for other belts. Like we're going to make the intercontinental title more important, um, U.S. title more important, so that whoever gets a title shot has actually been getting wins to kind of earn it rather than we're just going to have this guy get a title shot. Sure. We're going to get rid of a lot of the corny promos because there's I know there's a ton of them going on. Yeah. Uh, this one's going to be controversial because I know a lot of people like them, but uh, and I guess they're over, so I can't really hit it. But I don't like the new day. Hmm. Uh, but they're over. They're, I can't really hit it though because I know they're over. So I, obviously they're doing something right. What is um, it, what is it about them you don't care for? You just think they're too corny I, or too over I the top? I think it's too or? corny. Okay. I, I think it's too over the top and too corny, but but it's working. So I can't, like I said, I can't really hit it because it is working for what they're going for. So maybe that's just like a personal thing, but I, I think I, there's other stuff like I've mentioned that's obviously not working. Yeah, I think they just appeal to nerd fans, and me being a big nerd in general, I think that they just really appeal to that, you know, that, well, that, that people. So that set of people. So like when they when yeah. they have a time when they have a time machine, that's clearly just a giant box, <laughs> but but they but they make it out to be a time machine. Just things like that, you know, that make me laugh. But yeah. Now let me now let me point this out. And you're right about them. So I can't, like I said, I can't really hit the new day. Sure. But on Raw, like I, I read, so correct me if I'm wrong. You guys saw this, right? Rollins came out and attacked Roman after the match. Yes. Okay. So why why is Rollins coming out to the ring, and Roman comes out in the ring, and instead of right off the bat attacking him, because he jumped, Rollins jumped him last night. He gets in the ring and grabs a microphone. That just, if you're, especially if you're trying to make him look like a tough guy. Like he should come in the ring and just immediately start brawling with them, and now all of a sudden we there's people security out there separating him and all this stuff. I just think I think I think it almost looks too pussified. You know what I mean? You have to make yeah I, make it I, look like the attitude era almost. I think it's because we know Roman Reigns is really talented on the microphone, so he's gonna pick that. Oh up yeah. And he's gonna, <laughs> yeah. He's gonna and that's that another thing. Why does he ever have the microphone? Why does he ever have the microphone? That's I don't get that either. Uh, all right, so. 
basically, I think what it's, it sounds like what you're saying is just they, they, they need to start clearly defining some of their heel face roles because I think it's kind of muddled sometimes as to who's what. Yeah. I'm not sure if Roman's kind of a tweener right now. I mean, he gets booed. Mm-hmm. He does some heelish things, but at the end of the day, he's still kind of a face. So he's sort yeah. of in that muddled mid-space, and I just think that the heel face separation just really isn't there anymore. Um, mm-hmm. And then obviously you're, you know, you're you're talking about cutting down on some of the some of the promos and those types of things. So all right, good good points. Um, Halkster, do you have anything to kind of kind of carry on about what he just talked about, and then also like kind of your opinion on creative? No, I. Uh... There's, there's a lot I really agreed with you on, especially the, the Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins um, interaction, I guess. Uh, when when he showed up at the end of Payback, uh, I, I went nuts, and everybody in the crowd went nuts. And uh, yeah. even on Raw, I mean, it really, there really wasn't a true, I guess, alignment to really see quite yet. Um, what really irritated me was, uh, was his Thursday night. Uh, SmackDown promo where he comes out. Are you guys glad to see me? And the crowd erupts. No, really. Are you guys glad to see me? Like he's kind of, uh, what's the word? Uh, teasing that face reaction. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really riling up the crowd. And at the very end, well, I wish I could say the same. Ha ha ha. Mike drops and walks out. I'm like, oh, that asshole. Um, yeah. Like he plays a he great heel. Like he could be the top face in the company oh, right yeah. now. Uh, I was I was so waiting for him to have a, a Triple H type return where he, yeah. you know, he leaves as the, the top bad guy and comes back as this Mr. Kick-Ass baby face. I was so waiting for that, and it doesn't seem like we're going to get that. So I, I, I was really upset to see that. So I, I completely agree with you there. Um, as far as the New Day, I, I guess I, you know, I, I understand the, 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 the nerd geek niche, niche that they're kind of selling to. So I, I really have no problem with the New Day. I think that's probably one of the few things that they're really, really doing well. Um, but I, I also completely agree with the, the contendership, you know, who who deserves the, the right to challenge for the title yeah. uh, rather than just kind of random throwing together. I think with the Intercontinental title, I like the four-way, uh, fatal four-way interaction they're going with right now. I um, heard that was a real match. I didn't see um, it, but I heard it was a good match. Best it was a spectacular show. match. Yeah. Definitely a show stealer. Um, but it, it is kind of weird. And honestly, I think the Maurice angle having her interject to me kind of hurts it a little bit and nothing against yeah. Maurice and Miz because they do pretty well together. Um, but I think she's probably the weakest link in that program right now. Um, yeah, I'd completely, then, yeah, as far as, I'd completely disagree with you, but I can talk about that was my turn, but go ahead. All right. Well, we'll, we'll get, we'll get to that later then, I guess. <laughs> but, um, I think it's just cause she's typically when she grabs the mic, she's almost kind of like a step behind. Like she's not sure what she's going to say. And then she says something like, Almost half-assed, if that makes sense. Um, so that, that's that, that's where I'm coming from on that. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get your take later. And then, yeah, as far as the promos, um, I, I still feel like a lot of it is still very scripted. And I would like to see these guys just let loose because you know that they have the talent, especially seeing what they did in NXT and seeing what they did in, in a lot of the indies for uh, for some of our indie, indie darlings that are now making it big. Uh, I'd like to see just a little more let loose uh, and see some, you know, just – natural organic promos rather than just okay well i know he had to say that um well i think a big problem there is i I think they're not really giving him free reign anymore i think they give him actual scripted promos yeah yeah yeah, i I think you're right there (laughs) are certain people who get kind of liberties on creative i know new day does most of their own stuff now and that's mainly because they've proven they can do so but I don't yeah. think that they give enough people just chances to fail. It's almost like they're they're so scared to look bad that they look bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, and really, I mean, they don't have any other true competition. You know, they don't have the, the WCW like they had in the in the nineties. So yeah. why not? You know, why not take some risks? And um, exactly. one risk, I guess, that they're kind of taking is the uh, um, oh, man, the Bob Backlund thing. Make, Make uh, make Darren great again. Yeah. I I love seeing Bob Backlund back again. It's great to see him in a role, but those promos are just god awful. I I get it. They're pretty bad, but it's just hard to watch. <laughs> uh, all right. So Cedric, what do you have for us uh, on this topic? All right. Just keeping it, but only specific on the topic. Try not to rant too much. Um, I think they are partially 
to blame. I it's incredible for me to think that I, I if I'm not mistaken, Bert Hart has posted on eWrestlingNews.com a few times that there's approximately about 29 writers, if I'm not mistaken. Something like that. And, and I'm pretty sure that that's just the, the official ones. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Triple H and others pr- have their own ideas to include the wrestlers. So when you tell me that, if obviously if you believe the, the Twitter uh, post that Cody Rhodes uh, posted less than a week ago, that they had no idea what to do with him, and the same goes with others that have either not been on TV for a while or have actually requested to be released. It's a little bit disheartening and kind of worrying that a group cannot get together and and come up with storylines for these guys. I know Vince, if I'm not mistaken, Vince Russo and a few others have been pretty much the masterminds of the Attitude Era and all, and all that nonsense, and they were the ones that were pretty much told, hey, you know, you guys saved what could have been WCW going over WWF back in the day. So I know these guys left in a bad note, but if they're still there, if they can provide some talent, or not talent, but some ideas, I don't see why not hire these guys, even if it is from the sidelines or something. The uh, Paul Heyman, when he was running SmackDown with his storylines, you know, things like that. That's what, that's what I mean. But at the same time, to me, a man that gets so much credit when nobody really knows what he's doing, in fact, most people have no clue exactly what his position is. When you read Cody Rhodes' message, he says that Triple H also was not willing to listen to the things that he had, the ideas that he had. Something about almost like in a play, everybody has a role and you have your role to play. So even though the last person that dictates everything is Mr. McMahon, from Mr. McMahon down, anybody who has any control over storylines is to blame for whatever talent that got not so much destroyed, but never picked up in the WWE, if that makes sense. Sure. But at, at the same time, you know, it, it, my, my main thing is you can't just blame one person you just or, or just one team. Creative has their part. Obviously, leadership has their part. If you believe what Cody Rhodes said, where he's like, hey, I'm giving these guys amazing ideas, not just how to make myself look better, but also others who will be involved in the storylines. And he even named by name folks that were backing him up trying to get these guys to say, hey, you know what, this sounds like a good idea, but they didn't budge. And also I think the fans, you know, we have a, I've said it before, we have a fan base that pretty much cheers the the heel and boosts the face. And that too, it will not assist a talent growing as as a major attraction, if, if that makes sense. But I, But definitely creative has their part to play if they're not listening or if they can even come up with a good storyline, just read the internet out of, out of every crazy story that you might read. There's a few that you might, man, that might definitely work. I can see that working. I can see that helping the product. So. Okay. Yeah. I think obviously some good points that recovered a lot of stuff, um, and kind of gave our, our feelings on, uh, some of these things. I just want to take a real quick moment. To just talk about Cody Rhodes and hope, you know, that, that he has success in the future based on, on what happened. I, I have a lot of respect for him, particularly with the way that he handled the situation that he was given. I know that if somebody would have, you know, pretended to be on a laptop that's obviously off and was ignoring me, um, based on what he had written, uh, he's probably a nicer guy than I was because I, I probably would have got arrested and just went ahead and, and broke it and then asked if they were paying attention to me now. Um, but uh, I don't know. I think obviously he handled it as a kind of a, you know a class act in, in the way that he took part of it. Do you guys have any thoughts and opinions on what happened to Cody Rhodes? You know, it's it's a shame, especially you know one of the one of the sons of the great Dusty Rhodes. You know, they think that they would have a, at, at the very least more respect for just his lineage, I guess, and then just kind of almost thrown him to the side over the last few years. Um, you know, the guy. The guy obviously has talent. He's got charisma, and uh, you know, just just one of those things. We've already said it before about our thoughts on uh, on creative and booking. Um, but I really wish him the best. Uh, I could definitely see him as a 
as a top money maker and a, a potential game changer for a few other companies outside of WWE. And hey, we'll see what happens down the road. So no, pun, no, pun, no pun intended. I, I just like the way he said it himself. You know, it's not about him being a, a Rhodes. He himself said, you know, my dad was his own man. He he was Dusty Rhodes. He's like, I'm not. I don't want to be known as just Dusty Rhodes' son. He's like, I'm Cody Rhodes. I I have something that I can bring to the table if I'm being used correctly. And even he said it. You gave me chicken crap, and I made a really delicious chicken salad out of it. Anything they gave him, he was he pretty much played it pretty well. Even the ascension um, nonsense that he had, he he did the best that he could. The whole thing with the Steve, Stephen Amell. Oh, every little thing they got, the even with the feud, the joining and then the feud with his own brother. So he'll he'll do good if if he if he lands in a company that's willing to show off his wrestling skills and and his talent, you know, stuff like taking your own acting classes and other things in the, in your spare time to make yourself better. Definitely, there's no reason why he won't he won't succeed wherever he goes. And who knows, he might be back. It'll be one of those things he'll succeed somewhere else, and all of a sudden. WWE wants him back, so. Yeah, I uh, I just felt terrible, you know, from the what he was describing and the way people treated. I think it's to me kind of ridiculous that there's some keyboard warriors out there that are more responsible for the success and failure of some of these guys than our actual talent themselves. And sometimes, I guess, when it comes to big country, uh, our big company wrestling. I think that that's what really bothers me about it is the fact that these guys hold so much power over talent. Some of these guys have never been wrestlers at all. So, but all right. Well, we have two more things to cover uh, today. Kind of a interesting. I didn't even think about this when I put this together, but the instant classic match of the week this week is the Royal Rumble 1995 WWF. Uh, champion Bret Hart our uh, Diesel versus Bret Hart who was the challenger um, and then after that we actually have our fantasy booking which happens to be the Outsiders Hall and Nash um, versus the Bullet Club so we have a double dose of Nash coming up um, kind of like Magic Mike are you, you guys ready to go? Uh, I just hope nobody tears a quad yeah well I'll say that's a tough one in those matches <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> all right so Obviously, since since I picked the match, I will go ahead and give give my thoughts and opinions last. Before before we get into this, I just wanted to say I want to thank Tyler Copeland again for being on here. He had to go um, a little bit early, but uh, his insight was still valuable, particularly when we talked about creative. And then obviously had a had a great talk during his interviews. Just want to thank him again and and listen to you know a, a few minutes back. You can listen to him uh, plug all of his, his material if you want to see him. But mainly, just put in uh, Tyler Copeland wrestler. In YouTube, you'll find some good stuff in there, particularly the uh, the Halloween style promo we were talking about earlier. So, without further ado, uh, Cedric, why don't you start us off talking about this matchup? Well, this, this matchup, obviously, we have two Hall of Famers. You know, if if Kevin Nash is in, in yet, definitely he he will be. Um, and it was an old school pace. Something that I I, re, I hate to say I, I think probably would have gotten a few boring chants from the crowd today. Definitely the crowd back then was eating it up. They were enjoying it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I I put a few points. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna mention a few. I, I have a whole bunch. Of, I'm just gonna m- mention a few. The two two things that stood out for me was Brent Bret Hart's relentless attack on Diesel's leg. Obviously the smaller guy when when you find the the taller guy go for the legs, but also Diesel. Uh, going for Bret Hart's ribs, you know we don't. We, we've mentioned this before. You don't see much of that kind of wrestling nowadays, where you just focus on one body part in, in preparation for for a finishing move. Even even a figure four leg lock nowadays, the person hits the knee or the or the back of the leg twice, and then the figure four leg lock is is on. And I said, you know, Vince McMahon as commentator, I'm glad he's not doing that anymore. I, I think I got. A little bit bored of it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie to you. It was really good storytelling in the ring. Good ring psychology. I really appreciated that. I have forgotten. You know, Bret Hart's playing possum tricks. That was that was pretty cool to see again. Yeah. 
And the ending for me, I did not like it, but it was realistic. It, it played very well with the storyline. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those, like today, sometimes we'll watch something where like, we just don't like it, and that's it. This is one of those matches where I was like, you know what? Terrible ending, but I understand why they did it. And it makes it, it, it gave it almost a real feel to it. So in the show respect at the end, I had no problems with that either. You know, they, both guys were fan favorites at the time. One of them was transitioning maybe a little bit more towards the heel side, but then again, at the end of it, the show of respect was, was pretty awesome. All right, cool. Hawkster, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, pretty much uh, uh, kind of a repeat of what Cedric was saying. I love the uh, the strategic aspect or the uh, the tactician-type aspect of, of this match where both men went in there with an objective that they were trying to meet, Brett taking out the big man's legs and one of the – the few true seven footers that we have in this company. And, uh, you know, it's, you, you got to chop that tree down and the legs were the perfect way. Uh, one of my favorite spots where, uh, is where he's pulling him out, uh, towards the turnbuckle and, uh, just slamming that leg up against the turnbuckle. I, I, I see, you see a lot of guys doing that nowadays, but Bret Hart really was probably one of the better people doing that because it, it went into the sharpshooter um, and even the, the figure four leg lock that he would do on the on the turnbuckle as well like everything Bret Hart did made sense uh, so it was, it was really neat, it was one of my favorite spots um, and you could see Nash really selling the legs throughout the rest of the match uh, at one point it was almost like a uh, almost like a tiger bomb type power bomb where he doesn't lift him completely up for the jackknife. He just kind of almost barely gets him up and then does like the last little flip to drop him on his back. And then he sells the, you know, the pain after, after slam and then was like, Oh, that took a lot out of my legs. Uh, it was just a, a very, very good match, uh, from top to bottom, um, when it comes to the, the psychology and the storytelling inside the ring, uh, at the very end, um, this was like, this match happened like when I first really kind of got into wrestling. Uh, so I wasn't a true dedicated hardcore wrestler, wrestling fan. Um, but watching it back now after all these years, uh, like I completely forgot about the Owen Hart Brett stuff. Uh, and then when he come, when Owen Hart comes in and attacks Brett, I'm like, Oh, 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 okay. Okay. Oh, you're right. All right. And it just got my blood pumping. And then Shawn Michaels comes in and starts tearing on Diesel. I'm like, oh man, this is great. And then I, I, I agree with Cedric towards the end when everybody just bum rushes. I think Bob Backlund was in there too. And, uh, yeah, it just kind of just went chaotic. Uh, but it, it made sense and it was, it was very entertaining, especially for a Royal Rumble pay per view. So, uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, for me, the, the big takeaways for this match was the, uh, the psychology in the ring. You know, one man targeting the legs, the other targeting the torso or the rib cages. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just really fun to watch. Kind of a, a slower pace, um, but it really heated up. And, uh, it was, it was just fun to watch. For you guys that love slower pace matches, to me, this was, this was good pro wrestling. So now, um, I, I picked this match for a couple of reasons. Number one, I hadn't seen it in a while, but when I was younger, so 95, I would have been 13 years old. And, this time period in wrestling, although the roster in, in WWF at the time was pretty bad, there was a lot of kind of shining, there were still some shining stars in the, in the main event matches, and this was one of those ones I remember having recorded this rumble as a kid. I don't know how many times I watched it. I probably put it on for background noise every day for months, literally. So... You know, I could probably tell you the commentary of this match better than some of the wrestling in it in some instances just because of Vince and Jerry, like what they talk about. Um, but I love methodical chess game style of wrestling. And so the, to me, that's exactly what this illustrated. And, and when I talk about pacing in a match, you hear me talk about I don't know how many times, I really wish modern wrestling could slow down just a touch you don't have to Bret Hart was a fast fairly athletic guy but he just didn't move fast he didn't feel a need to move fast um in this match there 
really it was it wasn't about speed it was about isolation of a body part and, and working on it nowadays if you had a guy Bret Hart size versus a guy diesel size they'd have to go off the, the top rope every time or they'd have to figure out like the hurricane rana or something like that to get him down to the ground well, Brett just used a single leg takedown there were several instances where he just literally grabbed his leg and pushed it up took him down to the ground just like a wrestler would um so there's there's a lot of the the aspects that I really really enjoy in wrestling in in this match. Um, but even from the backstage interviews beforehand, where they have Todd Pettengale back there, uh, miss you Todd. But they had him they had him back there trying to do an interview, and basically they're gonna have none of it. Um, both guys super serious, both guys really intense on what they wanted. And I like Jerry Lawler says that both guys are trying to outcool each other earlier, and then now it was definitely time to wrestle. So um, I just wanted to say thanks to you guys for reviewing this match with me, and I think these are one of the best parts. I, I love to sit down with my kids and watch these matches and, and hear their thoughts about some of these uh, these older wrestling matches. So mm-hmm. History and heritage, baby. That's right. You guys have uh, any other comments uh, about this match before we move on? Oh, yeah, the last thing I want to say is uh, how in the world did did, uh, did Diesel make it through this match? <laughs> like he he got torn up on those legs. Like I I don't see how a seven footer can you know take that much damage and be able to walk uh, it, well without at least without limping like truly limping. So it, it just showcases how uh, how athletic and how strong he really was. You know most big big guys that you see aren't you know, really just jacked and stacked guys. They're, you know, they're, they're bigger, heavier set kind of guys. And, uh, I mean, he was, he was jacked and he was in shape. If he, he, he could probably behave the same way like a five foot ten or a six foot even guy would in the ring. But, you know, he had a foot taller than everybody else. You ever think maybe this match is why Kevin Nash blew his quad a whole bunch of times? <laughs> it could be very likely. It could be very likely. I mean, you know, he's, Definitely done a lot more in his career than just the damage he took in this match. But man, like he, he took some damage. Yeah. And, uh, it just goes up. The, the word methodical is the word I was looking for earlier. And I, I'm glad you said it because that, that, that really is the, uh, the key word for this match. This match is such a chess game from the beginning to end. And like you, you guys were talking about Bret Hart's ribs versus Diesel's legs and, you know, something had to give one way or the other. I didn't talk about the ending, I guess. Um, so Cedric, they they basically had the, the whole double run in. It ends up being a draw. Neither guy can continue. And it just sort of continued on the, the feud. But I think in a, in a match when you have two baby faces like that, to still have a heel element to the match where the heels are coming in and interfering with these two baby face matches, I think was kind of a kind of a good thing um but yeah you'd like to see a winner and i think my kids were a little bummed out too because they were they wanted to see like an actual winner when they watched it but overall um if you watch what happens later on down the line you know setting up what was to happen at wrestlemania later that year um i think that it uh it made sense the storyline and was uh definitely an, an entertaining match overall so i think it's good when we pick these matches that just sort of bring up memories for each of us because it's just lets us peek into each other's mind on the type of wrestling that we like so. going back to uh to the first topic uh we're talking about booking and creative uh you mentioned a really good point like what what happens in this match and the run-ins you know it leads two three months down the road to wrestlemania and it just seems like a lot of the stories we're given now are just very very short stories you know there's a few a few like really long drawn out Payoffs, but as far as the true storyline itself between uh, a wrestler, it just seems like we got a feud going on for three, four weeks. All right, here comes the first pay per view. Okay, it's over now, and then nothing happens afterwards. It just kind of okay. That that never happened. On to the next thing, and uh, I really think that uh, you know you go back, you know, ten, twenty years, and you could really learn a lot from storytelling and creative. I think the problem is, and I know we've talked about this before too, but the problem is, is when you, you have your stars wrestling on Raw every single week, um, it's hard to build a long drawn out storyline where 
the heel and the face, they, they interact, but they don't have an actual wrestling match for months on end. And that's one thing that you could do back in the 90s, especially if you watch Raw from 93 to about 96. Pretty much, mm-hmm. it was enhancement talent, guys they were putting over. You might have one upper mid-card, maybe even a main event guy wrestling on the card, but mostly it was mid-card and lower guys on Monday Night Raw. And then yeah, every you, once in a while you'd yeah. have a tag team kind of interaction, but the actual one-on-one face-offs never really happened. Yeah, very. Until the payoff. Very, very, yeah. Yep, and so we're talking, you build it up for three, four months. And then finally they, they get together. So it turned it into a big deal. Um, kind of like the whole Kurt Angle, Shawn Michaels thing, you know, when they had the brand split. I mean, that was yeah. so long in the making. So by the time they got in the ring, you were like, oh, I'm so ready. I am so ready to see, you know, who's, who's going to win. And so I think that it's hard to do that now, though, especially with two separate shows. And now they've announced the brand split and that they're going to have separate rosters and, and all that. I think that, um, I think it, we might see maybe a shift back to that, uh, but I guess only time will tell. But I, I definitely, as bad as the Raws pro- people would say they were to watch back then, I still, I personally enjoyed them highlighting a few talents on a show and then having one good quality match, but the shows were only an hour long. So, you know, but uh, all right, so... Thanks again, guys, and then uh, look forward to see whose who's pick it is. I think it should be Houkster's pick next week. I'll be interested to see what match he picks for the Instant Classic match of the week. All right. um, no sneaky peeks this week, but I no, got a good one planned. No sneaky peeks? All right. Last thing I want to do is continue. We're almost done with our opening round here for the tag team tournament, um, and today should be... A pretty good one and, and some good debate because we have the Outsiders, Hall and Nash, versus two Bullet Club members, Anderson and Gallows, um, and what we think would happen if these two tag teams were to meet up and go at it. So, Cedric, you being the sort of New Japan specialist the subject matter expert in that that particular department in wrestling do you want to talk to us about anderson and gallows and what they were like for those who never really watched them pre wwe well in 2013 uh, a man by the name prince david started a little fashion you know when you watch new japan pro wrestling the first thing that's going to stand out is Every wrestler, when announced, when they have their names posted uh, on the screen, they all have on the bottom what stable they come come from. So Prince David started his own little stable, uh, slowly building it with with um, Carl Anderson, Gallows. Eventually, AJ Styles comes in, takes over for him. We we have the Young Bucks. You name it, a few guys from, from Japan. It just pretty much just became this huge stable. And the tag team that most stood out among the, the whole stable was Luke Gallows and, and Carl Anderson. And nowadays when you hear the word, the phrase bullet club, it could be either them two or the stable, but for the, for purpose of this, of today's fantasy book, and it's them two. These guys were just brawlers. Even though Carl Anderson is the more technical of the two, they they were just brawlers. And the and the the main thing, I guess, in New Japan Pro Wrestling was where there was one, there was the whole group. Eventually, the whole group would come and and join in. And most of their matches were won because of of intervention. But really, there was no need because these two were just they would work very well together in in the ring. Carl Anderson would soften up the the opponent. Obviously, keep one part of the body isolated. And definitely, any time he would tag in Lou Gallows, it was pretty much just to inflict even more pain before Carl Anderson was coming in and just continuing the, bot, the, the one body part that they were working on. So, very methodical, very smash mouth, you know, a little bit of technical with Carl Anderson, but for the most part, it was just bro- a broader type style of wrestling in, in a place where strong style is mainly the, the style that they wrestle so 
he had to get with the times. And even though they were a little bit fast, there wasn't nothing aerial. Uh, that wasn't their, their strength. Their strength was just brawling, American style brawling, introduced to Japanese style, strong style wrestling. Okay. Um, so, for the purpose of this match, I guess we'll, do you, do you think that we should include the, at least one additional member of the Bullet Club potentially then, or do you think that it, it'd be fair enough if we just exclude it or we say that the Bullet Club members would be, uh, banned from ringside? We, we, we could, we could, for this one specifically, I think we can ban them. You know, like I said, realistically, in, in, in JPW, would that be the case that, you know, one of them would make their way in, if not all of them, at some point. But we, we can, we can obviously take them out or ban the rest of the, the rest of the club. That's fine. I just wanted to double check because obviously that could have a, a huge bearing over the, the outcome of the match. Um, so Cedric, your thoughts on the, uh, Bullet Club members Anderson and Gallows and their kind of their style in your opinion and just some thoughts about them as a tag team. I thank you, man. You hawk standing. Oh, all right. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of said a lot there, Cedric. Uh, really not much to go off of. Uh, the only really additional thing I've seen um, – and I think I'm probably going to be more expanding just to just the Bullet Club as a whole. Um, but really, a lot of comparisons uh, can be drawn to the Outsiders and uh, the eventual transition into the New World Order. Um, a lot of similarities. And to be honest with you, that's probably one of the main reasons I'm not a big Bullet Club fan. Because um, to me, I, I see them almost like a carbon copy of the NWO, or at least the original NWO. I mean, they even have the, you know, the click symbol, and they even do the two sweet. And who's famous for that? The Outsiders. So, um, a lot of a lot of comparisons pulled from uh, pulled from the NWO, pulled from the Outsiders. So I guess that's kind of one of the things I, I don't really care too much for. But watching them in the ring, um, they're definitely fun to watch. Very Smash Mouth brawler esque. Um, I love the uh, the rocket boot <laughs> that uh, I've seen in WWE. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of Gallows and Doc or Gallows and Anderson matches as a tag team, but I've definitely seen a lot of interaction in the ring during other matches uh, where they'll come in and just start beating everybody up. Um, but very entertaining. Um, but really, I mean, if you've seen a lot of the NWO stuff, early NWO stuff in WCW, uh, it's going to be a lot of the same. Uh, that's that's my two cents on it. Okay, yeah, I um, I think this is a tag team um, that is going to be eerily similar when we compare bo- both of these tag teams. You have the probably better workers, so to say, um, with uh, with Anderson o- o- over Gallows and kind of almost in that Arn Anderson type of role to get in and be aggressive and go after body part do what he needs to do, and then if you, if need be, get the big fella in there, try to overpower your opponent, you know, win that way. Um, so I think that's sort of what I what I took in from, from them as a, a tag team, although there's similarities, both guys use power moves. I would say, you know, both being brawlers, Anderson, though maybe being slightly more technical. Um, but, yeah, three-time uh, IWGP mm-hmm. tag champions and just over... You know, what, one or two years that they were together, that's a pretty impressive feat, uh, especially in, in that part of the world and in that company. So, um, obviously, from lineage wise, the, their ability wise, and just overall ability as a tag team, obviously very talented. So, we'll flip the switch back to you then, Hawkster. Um, when we talk about the outsiders, Hall and Nash, what do you think of them? What's their background? Uh, too sweet. Too sweet. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, yeah, both, uh, both coming from WWE, uh, the infamous curtain call in WWE leading to, uh, Nash and Diesel 
randomly, surprisingly showing up on WCW. Wait, those are WWF guys. What are they doing here? And they worked that whole invasion angle, and uh, that was it was really entertaining. Something very very different because uh, before then, I mean, if you acknowledge the other company, yeah, it was almost like a death sentence, you know. Um, so I thought it was a, a really neat working angle, and they would just come in and just beat the hell out of you, out of everybody. You know, this is this is WCW. This is where the big boys play. Come on, you know, we're we're gonna tear everybody up, and they did. Um, Love, love watching Nash, love watching, uh, Scott Hall, Razor Ramon, Diesel, whatever you guys want to call both of them. They've gone by many names, but yeah, Nash and Hall, uh, both very, very big guys, very big guys, but they're also great workers as well. And, um, uh, it's always fun to watch those two because they could do that powerhouse in your face kind of wrestling, but they also did have some really good technical abilities as well. I mean, we already talked about Nash's work during that uh, that Bret Hart match uh, before this, so love him. Cedric, your thoughts? Okay, one, one quick thing before before I mentioned um, the Outsiders. Uh, I was reading on the internet something I forgot to mention when I was talking about the Bullet Club, you know, since um, how Stanley, they mentioned how they are carbon copy of the NWO. Um, Kevin Nash has been quoted as, as, as praising the Bullet Club and calling them even a more athletic version of the NWO. So it's, they, they actually, in his opinion, they pretty much because of the respect that both stables had, they felt they were passing the torch to the Bullet Club. And oh, every little thing that you see that reminds you of them, whether it's the two suite or the moves or whatnot, according to, to Nash, for him it was a passing of the torch. And for the members of the Bullet Club to include the Jackson brothers, they mentioned this is just our way of paying homage to to the original stable, if you if you want to call it that way, and even Jeff Jarrett, who was part of both the club and NWO, has also mentioned that you know the biggest difference between both between both stables is the in-ring ability and the the bell to bell more talented athletes that the Bullet Club had. But that was just I just remembered because of what Hal Stanley was mentioning. Uh, what what else can be added about the outsiders? You know, two guys who played the role of yes, we're still part of the WWE, but we're coming here and invading to show off which two other companies was best. This was the dream thing that everybody wanted to see: these two companies literally going head to head, and it never happened. Even though we know that DX tried at one point, but to see two guys that were mainly known as WWE guys fighting in in WCW was pretty was pretty amazing at the time. Definitely revo- revolutionary, and then we know what happened afterwards when the NWO got got formed, the the infamous Hogan heel turn, which so many want Cena Cena to do the same thing, but it just worked out. But them two as a group, I think you know you had two powerhouses, and just like how how Stanley said, these are two guys that had moves. We saw. Diesel versus Bret Hart before, like we discussed, even though this, the Scott Hall wasn't this Diesel, he still has some of the moves, but he wasn't this guy. And then, and then again, Scott Hall, he had his moves. You, the best ladder match, the, the originator, you know, Shawn Michaels versus Razor Ramon. Obviously, this Scott Hall had some of those moves, but definitely they were at, at an older age and it wasn't the same, but they were pretty good. They were pretty good. They, any team that got in their way, they pretty much leveled with, Mainly power moves, if anything. There was not going to be any flippy stuff <laughs> between these guys. If there was somebody flipping, there was the opponent flipping over. Yeah, it was so, the uh, follow away slam that <laughs> right. that, that Scott Hall would do. Continue. You either had you either had your jackknife power bound from one guy, or you had the the razor's edge from Scott Hall. But it was all. Well, this is WCW. Movies. This is the outsider's, outsider's edge. edge. The outside. My bad. The outsider's edge. Uh, you gotta, you gotta, gotta go with the branding, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's fine. Um, quick thing for you then. You were saying Razor Ramon was the innovator of the the ladder match. Well, the the first match, ladder match, wasn't it them two, Shawn Michaels and? No, I think it was Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart before that. Um, they were the first like high visibility one, like. On a pay-per-view, I think, but I think Sean yeah. and Brett had one before that. 
in the yeah, they, I don't. I don't think it was a dark match or a live a live show match. I don't think it was ever broadcast. It's it's on uh, the. I, think, I know there is there it, is a television or a, there is a recording of it. It's but I don't on, know if it was ever actually put on. It's on the ladder Saturday match. Night. It's on the ladder match DVD. And the only mm. reason I remember that is because Bret Hart always talks about how a ho they get credit for being the first ever ladder match. We, me and Sean, had a ladder match <laughs> like a year before that. But anyway. <laughs> Continue on. I just was trying to think if my, my facts were straight or not. I couldn't remember. Um, no, yeah, you're, you're right. It's just, um, yeah, it, it wasn't a high high visibility thing, or it wasn't a, a, a huge built up thing like it was uh, at WrestleMania. It, it definitely wasn't as good a match as that one at WrestleMania. That one was pretty incredible. Um, all right. So, Outsiders. Oh, man. You know, it's funny because. I was one of those people, and I think I was still young enough when all this was going on to... I mean, I knew the whole work in the ring, and I knew the the way pro wrestling worked, but this angle in particular seems so real from a storyline perspective, where I look on TV and I'm like, what the hell are, are Diesel and Razor Ramon doing on you know, Nitro? And then... You got everything that's going on, and then the eventual turn of Hulk Hogan. Um, the, those two guys in particular got me to switch the channel and watch WCW, because otherwise I never watched. I, I'd watch WCW like on Saturday nights every once in a while, or you know, but I, I never really watched Nitro because I was watching Raw. And when those two guys went over there, it was always one of those things to where now it, it had my attention. So just. From that aspect, that that was my first experience really with them. Um, as a tag team, though, you're talking about two guys who have an intelligence. One, Kevin Nash has a very high intelligence for the business, and he also has a very high intelligence for the um, like a, a wrestling IQ for finishes, the way that stuff works. And then you have Scott Hall, mm-hmm. who has one of the best uses of psychology maybe since Jake Roberts, his ability to, to use psychology in the ring and to break break the match down. So if you just take them as individuals, um, obviously both extremely talented. If there was a politician score, um, Kevin Nash might have the highest of any wrestler maybe ever. Um, the, guy, the guy was a backstage politician like through and through and through. But, um, what about Jesse Ventura? I mean, he was a governor. Yeah, you know, but even Oh, different then, kind I, of politics. I, hey, you know, the... Are they both bad kind of politics? Yeah, I don't know. That's a story for another day. But but um, I think that these two guys had a obviously a, a good chemistry as a tag team and at one point basically beat up the entire WCW roster. And Eric Bischoff, Bischoff was willing to give them an opportunity to make the rest of WCW's roster look weak by having them get beaten up by two guys that came from the WWF. And I... I I just think the way that they were booked was so strong, so dominant. Um, but the real question is, if these two teams were to square off, who would win? That That's what we're trying to come around to. So, Halkster, why don't you start us off? Who's your pick? All right. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that you put me in here first because uh, – Again, I, I haven't watched a lot of NJPW. You know, I've seen quite a few matches online, but as far as the actual product, it, it, it's only been maybe two or three episodes where I've watched the full product. So uh, I know storyline-wise and continuity, um, the wise old owl has a has definitely has a leg up on me here. So I'm I'm hoping to that he can put some knowledge in me after I get done talking. But the biggest points for me in this match is uh, I don't know if I've ever really seen Gallows and Anderson take on people who are truly the size and strength of Hall and Nash. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, yeah, I think that's going to be a big a big takeaway here um, because Hall and Nash, even at the age that they were, and they were kind of slowing down when they got to WCW and formed the Outsiders, but they, they could go and just like you said, probably two of the best ring generals and uh, best psychologists inside of a squared circle that this company's probably ever seen. Um, so I think they definitely have the edge 
<laughs> on the outside looking in. <laughs> hey. um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it would be a very, very entertaining match, uh, a very hard hitting, very brutal type match. Obviously, there's going to be some spillage to the outside. And uh, even though we've barred the Bullet Club from from ringside, I I don't see that really happening, I guess. So I think there'd definitely be some kind of interference, and uh, that would definitely come in, uh, come in and make its status known. But there's that third member of, uh, of the Outsiders. Yeah, until it comes crashing and, uh, down and it hurts inside. And it, it, it's going to hurt inside of Gallows and Anderson once... Uh, as Hogan comes in there and drops that leg on every member of the Bullet Club, and uh, Nash is going to pick up Gallows because Gallows is the bigger one. Nash is the bigger one. He's going to drop that jackknife, and uh, and Anderson's going to get li- lifted up, you know, pretty much crucified in the air, and brought down with the Outsiders' edge. So I'm I'm going with the Outsiders. I'm going with the original, you know, the original OG here. Uh, I think I just said that twice. Is that what OG stands for? Original gangster? Or, or I don't know. Original, original gangsters. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I gotta give it to him. And again, the main reason power and strength and size is a definite advantage. And at least from what I've seen of the Bullet Club before they came to WWE, is that there's just so many similarities. And uh, I, you know, I get the, the passing of the torch. Uh, kind of thing with Nash endorsing the Bullet Club. I, I get that. I totally respect it. Um, but the sequel is never as good as the original. So I got I got to give it to the outsiders here. Okay, um, Cedric, what do you think? Well, uh, I see the points that Hawk Stanley's making, and and I, and I guess you know, and any one person, you know, fans of the original, like he said, and who has who's only Oh, how do you say? Any person that all they've really seen of the Bullet Club is what we've seen in WWE. Definitely, I wouldn't. Yeah, no, I would I'm not limited. I admit that. I would not side with the club because, I, to be honest with you, this is a whole different story. This is a whole different topic. But talking about creative, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of how they've been booked in the WWE because the Bullet Club, Car Anderson, and Luke Gallows that I that I remember from my time watching NJPW. And Ring of Honor and other companies that they've been part of, definitely they would have, you know, cleaned the Usos and anybody else they put in front of them. Um, these guys, like you mentioned, three times they they've been IWGP champions three three times, even going through their the famous tournaments that IWG, uh, NJPW puts to get to the championship itself. I've seen them beat not just. Togi Makabe and, and Tomoaki Homa, which if you can see these guys, these are guys like strong style, just in smash mouth in your face, not no pretty way of putting it mm-hmm. to get the win. But I've also seen the feet, you know, Dave, Dave Boy Smith Jr., which wasn't a small guy in his own right, and Lance Archer, who wasn't also a, a small guy himself. So I've seen them fight both small, fast, strong type wrestlers, and I've seen them fight taller, bigger um, wrestlers, you know, from European style to Japanese strong style to American style. I've seen the Bullet Club fight just about anybody and everybody. And as you guys already mentioned, the outsiders were not who they were when they were just individually in, in WWE. I respect what they did individually. Some of the matches that I saw of them together, these were two individuals teamed as teamed up as a tag team, but really not much tag team wrestling mm-hmm. being put out. At least the matches that I watched, and I'll watch. I'll admit I watched four or five, but definitely you know you can watch so many WCW matches between the, that these guys were part of. I understand they came in destroying the, the the competition, but when I look at tag team, in Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson, I see two guys who as individuals have success, but as a team they meshed as a team, and you see tag team wrestling where they isolate the guy in a corner, where you see Carl Anderson doing his his movements, you know, isolating a, a body part. Obviously, we know Kevin Nash's history with his legs, so I can see him working the legs, and Luke Gallows and the constant tagging in and out, just working that part. Definitely, there's going to be some power moves from Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. There's no way they wouldn't, at some point, be dominating, but I just see the bigger tag team psychology 
going in favor of the Bullet Club. And once again, I've seen them beat all different styles of, of mix and match tech teams. And one thing that put me over yesterday, I watched a match where it was Miss Elizabeth's hair or, wh- or whatever name she went by in WCW versus Rey Mysterio's mask. And Rey Mysterio had the better part of Kevin Nash. And I was like, what in the world? If it wasn't for intervention and Scott Hall doing the outsider's edge, we had a knocked out Kevin Nash because supposedly the knee brace on Rey, on Rey Mysterio had hit him and he was completely knocked out cold. I was like, okay, so if Little Man has you, I'm pretty sure these two guys who have more tag team ring psychology than you guys I'm pretty sure they will get the upper hand eventually. And either f- finisher, whether it be the, the pole that Gallows does or the stun gun that Carl Anderson will do or just their boot destroyer that you mentioned earlier or the magic killer, I could just see eventually these guys winning. No intervention from nobody from either NWO or the Bullet Club, the rest of the club. I just see, I, I go with the Bullet Club on this one. This one was really hard for me because I I really went out of my way to to try to find several matches of each and had to shut my brain off about what I knew about about Hall and Nash as individual wrestlers. So um, this is one of those matchups where were Hall and Nash good enough individually to beat a collective tag team? Um, Man, you know, I almost hate having the deciding vote in this one. Um, but I see stylistically, I think Kevin Nash is a little bit stronger than, than Gallows in, in his prime anyway. And then, um, I see Hall being far superior to Anderson in, uh, Eh, in in power, but as well as just athleticism and uh, their overall. Like I guess if they had to if they had to pair up, um, if vice versa are in the ring, I think that Hall is still big enough to to kind of hang in there with with Gallows if he needed to, and Nash can work well enough to work against Anderson. It's just a matter of can they counter each other's you know the the tag team maneuvers. Of Anderson and, and, and Gallows, and to me, man, I just I have to say I have to say yes, they can only because of the the dominance that Hall and Nash had in WCW. Um, I remember that match you're talking about with with Rey Mysterio, and I think it, you know, it, it's one of those ones where they they were they were putting Rey Mysterio in kind of that giant killer type of thing at the time, um, and he had wrestled. Uh, the giant and that kind of stuff as well. Um, so it didn't. I, I remember seeing that angle where he got he got kneed by the brace and it, it knocked him out cold. Um, but since we're we're only talking Anderson and Gallows, you know, we're we're not talking you know any of their their other their other prior gimmicks. That was a really good point. In fact, that had me thinking for a minute now. But I think I'm still gonna go with the outsiders for me overall, only because I think that. Those two guys are so dominant as singles wrestlers and so much better than the other two as singles wrestlers that even as a good tag team, I believe that they could they could overcome the teamwork of Anderson and Gallows with their overall ability in the ring. So sounds like two to one outsiders are gonna move forward over Anderson and Gallows and we should only have one match left for next week, right? Nope. Oh, we have two more. Two more? So, I think we should probably do, let's get this weird quirky one out of the way next week. If it's alright with you fellas, we'll do the, uh, the Briscoes versus the Bushwhackers, um, or the matchup with no teeth. Uh, as, as, as we'll, we'll match it up. But, uh, yeah, the, the, the classic face, uh, Bushwhackers, silly quirky cannonball head use, Head licking, face licking, kid licking individuals, um, versus the, uh, the Ring of Honor, Greats, uh, and Brothers of Briscoes. Um, anybody, uh, have any objections to that? Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, 
I'm gonna like talking about them boys. Them boys. Yeah, I've tried to watch more of their stuff. I haven't. I'm, I'm not as familiar with them as I probably. I'm, I've seen more of them as individual wrestlers now because I didn't catch them when they were wrestling as much as tag teams. But, um, so, any other thoughts before we before we end the show? It's been a been a good show. Some really good discussion. That was a really close matchup in the the tag tournament. I don't know if we picked two tag teams that could be any more similar than this particular matchup. Yeah, I, I like it. I like it. And uh, if it's all right with you guys, I think I am going to throw out a little sneak peek. Sneak if, uh, peek. If, if you guys want to peek a little sneak here. I'll take a sneaky peek. All right. Well, since we went with the uh, the double header for Nash uh, taking on as Diesel against Bret Hart, I think we should go ahead and uh, give Bret Hart a back-to-back main event here. And uh, since... Granted, this will be next week, but uh, a few days ago was the anniversary of uh, Owen Hart's passing. So, to me, what better way to uh, to to send off a good memorial and a celebration than to have Owen Hart versus Bret Hart at WrestleMania 10? Wow, yeah, that's a good one. I'll say I don't know which one's better, that one or their cage match. Both are so good. Um, you know, I was really, I was really hard to go between those two matches because I loved the cage match too, but there was, there wasn't as much of a, of an outside storyline going on in the singles match, just the regular singles match. So I think I'd rather analyze that one if that's all right with you guys. Yeah, it sounds great, man. It's your pick, so that'll be a good one. Of course, I'll watch a Bret Hart match any day. So, <laughs> Cedric, you, you all right got, with that, Cedric? Yes, you got any takeaways? I got no issues with that. Awesome. Cool. Well, I guess then, uh, if anybody has anything else, I'll go ahead and, uh, end with our normal courts adjourn. Thank you so much for listening and looking forward to, to seeing these matchups for next week. And thank you again, guys.